British colonialism was responsible for more than 100 million deaths in India. That is according to a new academic study by mainstream Western scholars. Once again, the British Empire is responsible for more than 100 million deaths when India was colonized by the British Empire. And that is just in 40 years of the British Empire. Britain colonized the Indian subcontinent for nearly 200 years. So w just 40 years of those 200 resulted in more than 100 million deaths. This is according to a study that was done by an economic anthropologist who's a very good scholar named Jason Hickel. He teaches at the Institute for Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He also teaches at the London School of Economics. Again, I want to repeat, he's a pretty mainstream scholar who does really good work. And he also wrote this with Dylan Sullivan, another scholar. And they published this in an academic study that was published in World Development, which is an academic journal. But for, for, for our purposes today, it's much more important, I think, to look at the article they wrote for a common lay audience in Al Jazeera. And the article they titled is How British Colonialism Killed 100 Million Indians in 40 Years. Now, today I'm going to be going through several of these articles because there are other articles that are related. And I will, of course, as always, link in the description below to a, an article at multipolarista.com that includes links to all the sources I cite. So you can find links to all of these. Now, they, the scholars noted that just in 2020, a poll found that one third of people in Britain are proud of the British Empire. What they probably don't know is that the British Empire killed more people even than fascism. I mean, of course, fascism has its origins in European colonialism. The Nazis were inspired by the British Empire. The Nazis were inspired by the U.S. Empire and the settler colonialism against native peoples. So, quite literally, fascism emerges out of European colonialism. Ap fascism was the application of European colonialism internally within Europe. And we can see the fascistic policies carried out by the British Empire in India. Extreme poverty in India increased under British colonial rule. In 1810, 23% of people in India lived in extreme poverty. In the mid 20th century, in the mid 1900s, 100 years later, more than 50% of Indians lived in extreme poverty. That's to say that from the 19th to the 20th century, in that 100 year period, extreme poverty more than doubled under the British Empire in India. Famines became more frequent and much more deadly. Far from benefiting the Indian people, colonialism was a human tragedy with few parallels in recorded history. So when you see these far-right pundits at Fox News, and certainly not just Fox News, but especially, you know, Tucker Carlson had this speech recently in which he, he praised British colonialism for helping India. No, that is ridiculous fascist propaganda. That is not at all what happened. It's the exact opposite. From 1880 until 1920, the height of Britain's imperial power, the death rate led to around 100 million deaths. So the death rate increased considerably from in this period from 37 deaths per 1,000 people in the 1880s to 44 deaths in the 1910s. Life expectancy declined from 26 years to 22 years. That's to say, in the 1910s, in British colonized India, the average life expectancy was 22 years. And it decreased over time. It did not increase. They used data on real wages showing that in 1880, Living standards in colonial India had already declined dramatically from their previous levels. Before British colonialism started in India, which is around the 1770s, Indian living standards were roughly on par with the developing parts of Western Europe. That is to say, before European colonialism, 
the global south, for the most part, especially India and China, which were major industrial powers. Well, industrial is the wrong word because this is, this is the period of industrialization. They were major manufacturing powers, major economic powers. Before European colonialism, the living standards of average people in China and India was roughly equal to the living standards in Europe. It was European colonialism that made the global south poor. That is why still today so many countries in the global south suffer from poverty. Their research finds that according to, according to their, their uh, estimate, using the assumption of what mortality rates were in India before British colonialism, assuming it was around 27 deaths, which was per 1,000, which is what it was in England at the time. They estimate that that means that from 1881 until 1920, in 40 years of British colonialism, 165 million ex de excess deaths occurred in India. And they say that, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the number that you use depends on the data that you use there. So you can have a slightly different result. But the point is that we're talking about around 100 million people died prematurely in British colonized India at the height of the British Empire. They note this is the largest policy-induced mortality crisis in human history. Now, they also point out that this is larger than all of the combined number of deaths from all famines that occurred. And, and even these numbers of deaths of these from famines are grossly exaggerated. And the Soviet Union, China under Mao Zedong, North Korea, Cambodia, Ethiopia. Now, that's a, this is a topic for a whole other conversation. The numbers of the famine deaths in those countries are grossly exaggerated by extremely shoddy, unprofessional academic work written by Western scholars who are not really doing actual academic research and scientific research. They're simply trying to create political propaganda to demonize communist governments. I mean, it, it's a topic for a whole other conversation, but the famines that happened under Mao in China were the last famines that happened in China's history. Before the, the Chinese Revolution in 1949, on average, there was a famine every two or three years on average for hundreds of years. And it was the communist revolution in China that put the, an end to famines. There has never been a famine since the famines that happened after the Great Leap Forward. That was the last famine after quite literally thousands of years of a famine on average every two or three years in feudal China. And then, and then capitalist partially colonized China when it was partially colonized by European powers. Same thing in the Soviet Union. The last famine that ever happened in the Soviet Union was that the famine that happened and that it was not a targeted political famine against Ukraine that was used as quite literal Nazi propaganda by Nazis who were trying to whitewash the crimes committed by the genocidal Nazi regime and say that, oh, the Nazis and the, and the Soviets were the same and the Nazis actually weren't that bad because the Soviet Union committed more. It's literal Nazi propaganda. No, the, and also the great famine that happened in the Soviet Union, was, which was the last famine in the history of Russia and the other parts of the Soviet Union at the time, including Ukraine, that famine affected everyone in the Soviet Union. And it actually affected people in Central Asia and certain parts of Russia more than it affected Ukraine. It was not a targeted famine against Ukrainians. Anyway, whatever. The point is that this is a whole other extremely complex topic. But the point is that even if you take the completely fake fabricated numbers from Western right wing scholars who are trying to make anti-communist propaganda, even if you take those numbers, those numbers are still smaller than the 165 million excess deaths that occurred under the British Empire in India in 40 years from 1880 until 1920. I'm not a big fan, honestly, of this excess deaths methodology because this is exactly what is used to try to create crazy numbers and things like the Black Book of Communism, which was written by a pro-fascist right-wing scholar, and that book has been used since, which is completely discredited. Mainstream scholars have discredited that book completely, but the author who br brought together a bunch of pro-fascist European scholars to write 
this book, The Black Book of Communism, he later admitted that he was just obsessed with trying to get 100 million out of the 100 million death estimate, which is completely fake. And in order to get that 100 million death estimate in the Black Book of Communism, he included all of the Nazis and fascists who were killed by the Soviet Union and the Red Army in World War II as so-called victims of communism. So according to the fascist authors of the, the Black Book of Communism, they literally considered Hitler to be a victim of communism and all Nazi genocidal war criminals to be victims of communism. Anyway, whatever. I mean, so I, I, I'm not going to spend more time talking about that topic. It's a whole other dis topic for another discussion, another analysis, another day. But the point is that the British Empire has more blood on its hands than any other regime in recorded history. And that's why the Nazis were inspired by the British Empire. And that's why Winston Churchill admired Adolf Hitler when he came to power. And Winston Churchill in the late 20s and early 30s wrote speeches and articles praising Hitler and saying that he helped save Germany from Bolshevism as Winston Churchill said. I'll come back to Winston Churchill in a second because he has the blood of millions of Indian victims on his hands. So anyway, let me continue reading here from this article by the scholar Jason Hickel, published at Al Jazeera. He explains, so why did absolute poverty increase under British colonialism in India? Why did so many people die, over 100 million Indians die? Well, it's because Britain destroyed India's manufacturing sector. Prior to colonization, India was one of the largest industrial producers in the world. India exported high quality textiles to all corners of the globe. The low quality cloth produced in England simply could not compete. But that changed when the British East India Company colonized Bengal in 1757. So this is the beginning of British colonialism in India, which ended in 1947. So it's 190 years of colonialism. Now, of course, the British East India Company was closely related, closely linked to the British government. And so when we talk about the British East India Company, it's basically a semi-private, semi-public arm of the British Empire. So the British Empire destroyed the Indian manufacturing sector by removing all protectionist measures, including tariffs, and flooding the domestic market in India with these cheap, low-quality British goods. And at the same time, so while they were destroying the Indian textile industry, the British Empire also created a system of exorbitant taxes and internal duties that prevented Indians from selling cloth within their own country, let alone exporting it. So the British Empire destroyed local Indian industry and made Indians buy low-quality British goods. This unequal trade regime crushed Indian manufacturers and de-industrialized the country. The chairman of the East India and China Association boasted in the English Parliament in 1840, quote, This company, that is the East India Trading Company, has succeeded in converting India from a manufacturing country into a country exporting raw produce. Boasting of destroying British, uh, destroying Indian industry. So, and still today, neoliberal economists constantly tell countries that it's in their competitive advantage, countries in the global south, that is, it's in their competitive advantage to simply export raw materials and agricultural products. It's in their comparative advantage and they should do that and they shouldn't focus on technological production. And that continues to trap them in this same kind of colonial relationship that we saw at the peak of European colonialism. Now, British colonizers also created a system of legal plunder known today as the drain of wealth. Put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to that thought as I look at the research of the Indian economist Utsa Patnaik. But I'll come back to that in a bit here. The British Empire taxed the Indian population and then used the revenues to buy Indian products, thus obtaining these goods for free. This is how India basically stole wealth, trillions of dollars of wealth from India. The British Empire stole trillions of dollars of wealth from them. These goods were then either consumed within Britain or re-exported to other parts of the imperial core. 
And the revenues that were taken from India were pocketed by the British state and used to finance the industrial development of Britain and its settler colonies, United States, Canada, and Australia. So quite literally, the Western powers were developed based on stealing wealth from the colonies, especially India. This colonial scheme drained trillions of dollars in today's money from India. The uh, Indian economist Utsa Patnaik estimates $45 trillion. The British were merciless in imposing the drain, forcing India to export food even when drought or floods threatened local food security that contributed to tens of millions more deaths due to starvation caused by policy-induced famines in the late 19th century. That's just the late 19th century in the 1800s. I'm also going to talk about the Bengal famine that killed between three and four million Indians in Bengal in the 1930s. But so we're talking about, again, tens of millions of Indians who died in British Empire intentionally created famines. British colonial administrators were fully aware of the consequences of their policies. They watched as millions of Indians starved to death and they did nothing to change course. They continued to knowingly deprive people of resources necessary for survival. And their research shows that Britain's exploitative policies were associated with approximately 100 million excess deaths in the 40 years from 1880 until 1920. This is a straightforward case for reparations with a strong precedent in international law. They note, for instance, that, that Germany, after the Holocaust, paid reparations to victims of the Nazi genocide. And rep, uh, they also paid reparations to M Namibia for colonial crimes that were committed. Similarly, South Africa paid reparations to people who were terrorized by the apartheid regime. So again, just as the Nazis were inspired by European colonialism, and just as post-Nazi Germany paid reparations, the British Empire and all European colonial powers and the US and Australia should pay reparations to the former colonial victims of their genocidal crimes. So this is a, a very good report by the scholar Jason Hickel and his colleague Dylan Sullivan. Now, I'm going to look at a similar uh, scientific study that came out in 2019. And this, there was, this is also reported in Al Jazeera. It's titled Churchill's Policies to Blame for 1943 Bengal Famine. So this was back in 2019. The Bengal famine of 1943, estimated to have killed up to 3 million people, some estimates say even 4 million, was not caused by drought. It was instead a result of the policies of then British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And there is scientific backing for this argument. This is based on a, a scholarly report, a scholarly article that was published by academic experts on agriculture. They, lo they looked at soil in India at the time. The study found that the soil in Bengal, in the famine-affected region, received above normal precipitation in 1943. That is to say, there was not a shortage of rain. It was not a drought that caused it. It was the British Empire's policy. The British Empire exported wheat, and the British Empire imposed grain import restrictions on British colonized India that prevented the local governments from importing food as their people starved to death. The Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen argued in 1981 that there was enough, there were no, enough supplies in Bengal to feed the population in 1943, but instead the British colonial regime exported food to make money on exporting food while millions of people starved to death. And they quote the Indian politician Shashi Tharoor, Shashi Tharoor, who I'm going to come back to in a second. He was a, a United Nations Undersecretary General and a, an Indian politician. And he has done a lot of research on the Bengal famine and the crimes committed by Churchill. He said Churchill has the blood of millions on his hands. Churchill deliberately ordered the diversion of food from starving Indian civilians, 
to well-supplied British soldiers and even to top up European stockpiles. So obviously at this time, the, the British were fighting the Nazis after Ch Churchill had met, spent many years admiring Hitler and Nazi Germany and, and hoping that they could ally with Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union. And it, uh, that didn't work out, obviously. But so obviously at this point in 1943, the British were fighting the Nazis, although they were not doing very much fighting compared to the Soviet Union. 27 million Soviets died over 80% of the Nazi casualties in World War II were on the Eastern Front caused by the, the Soviet forces. Only 400,000 Brit British died and 400,000 US Americans died, whereas 27 million Soviets died. So anyway, the point is, but at this point, the British were kind of fighting the Nazis, but they did not have a shortage of food. So there was no justification for taking food away from the from India. It was an intentional policy of genocide. And of course, we know that that Churchill himself, he wrote in his he wrote in his diary that Indians, he said Indians are a beastly people. And he said that they are breeding like rats and he, he wanted them to die. And when, when he when he was told, he knew that millions of people were dying in India. And when it was reported to him, he said, then why isn't Gandhi dead yet? So once again, the, this scholar, Janam Mukherjee, who wrote a book about the Bengal famine, said, quote, The Bengal famine was not the result of agricultural failure, but of human action. So once again, these are the genocidal crimes committed by the British Empire in India. Now, I mentioned Shashi Tharoor, who is a well-known Indian politician from the Congress Party. And he also was an undersecretary general for the United Nations or under general secretary for the United Nations. And this is an article in a local Indian media outlet. Shashi Tharoor compares Winston Churchill to Hitler, says he was responsible for Mengal famine. I mean, that's that's an objective fact. And once again, I mean, Churchill admired Hitler. So they I mean, this estimates four million, three or four million died from starvation and malnutrition during the famine in Bengal, while Britain exported huge amounts of food from India, including 70,000 tons of rice in the same year, 1943, of the Bengal famine. What, what did Churchill say? He said, quote, this is an exact quote from Winston Churchill. I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. The famine was their own fault for breeding like rabbits. And and, and uh, Shashi Tharoor, the Indian politician, says, quote, Churchill has as much blood in his hands as Hitler does, particularly the decisions that he personally signed off on during the Bengal famine when 4.3 million people died because of the decisions he took or endorsed. Now, keep in mind, this is four, three or four million deaths in addition to the more than 100 or potentially 165 million Indians who died under the British Empire from 1880 until 1920. So once again, quite literally hundreds of millions of people died because of European colonialism. Just the British Empire alone is responsible for well over 100 million, maybe who knows, 200 million deaths in India. Now I mentioned that Winston Churchill admired fascism. He, in the early 1930s, he supported Hitler and Mussolini. Even the Churchill Project, which is run by a bunch of conservatives who, who worship Churchill, even they admitted that Churchill, quote, expressed admiration for Mussolini, the Italian dictator who quite literally founded fascism. And again, these, these are his Churchill's own hagiographers. They admitted, they, they wrote, quote, if forced to choose between Italian fascism and Italian communism, Churchill unhesitatingly would choose the former, that is fascism. And... So once again, this is from the Churchill Project. Now, in 1935, Churchill published an article praising uh, Adolf Hitler for his courage. Now, this is from the website, the International Churchill Society, which once again is run by a bunch of conservatives who love Churchill. So these are the most biased people possible, but even they have to acknowledge this unfortunate fact for them. So in 1935, Winston Churchill wrote an article praising Hitler that was called The Truth About Hitler. 
Now, he did criticize Hitler a little bit in the article. It wasn't all positive, but he did say a lot of things praising Hitler. And the fact that he even said anything praising Hitler shows that he was, he was sympathetic to fascism. Because once again, fascism comes out of, Brit of European colonialism. There is a direct line from British colonialism and U.S. settler colonialism in, in the Americas and French colonialism directly to fascism. That's directly, that's, there, there's no difference between them. As uh, Aimé Césaire famously said in, in his famous uh, essay, Discourses on Colonialism, fascism was the application of European colonialism internally within Europe. And we see the, that, so in 1935, Churchill wrote this, this article about Hitler, the truth, it's called The Truth About Hitler. And then in 1937, Churchill slightly edited the same essay that he had written and he published, he titled it as Hitler and his choice. And he published it in a book that was written by Churchill called Great Contemporaries. So if you're watching here, this, this article here from the Winston Churchill International Society, it has some, some lines that were crossed out and those lines crossed out were originally written in the original article that he wrote in 1935, Winston Churchill. So in this article in 1935-1937, Winston Churchill's warning about the rise of communism in Europe, and he talks about Germany and in this anti-Semitic stereotype that he's contributing to, claiming that Jews were the main prop of communism. Uh, Winston Churchill himself was also deeply anti-Semitic, and he wrote an article in 1920 titled Zionism versus Bolshevism, a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people. And he spreads these kind of fascistic uh, talking points claiming that communism was a Jewish plot. I mean, he agreed with Hitler in, in many ways. Again, the fact that Winston Churchill committed genocide in India is why he's not seen as Hitler. They were both genocidal racist warmongers who have the blood of millions and millions of victims on their hands. So, uh, once again, I mean, we can see his, his sympath uh, the British Empire's deep sympathies for fascism everywhere you look. So go going back to this essay that Winston Churchill wrote in 1935, where he praises Hitler, he wrote, While all these formidable transformations were occurring in Europe, Corporal Hitler was fighting his long, wearing battle for the German heart. The story of that struggle cannot be read without admiration for the courage perseverance, and the vital force which enabled him, Hitler, to challenge, defy, conciliate, or overcome all the authorities or resistances which barred his path. He and the ever-increasing legions who worked with him. He's talking, Churchill's talking about the German stormtroopers who massacred Jews and put communists in concentration camps. Churchill says that Hitler and his followers certainly showed at his time, this is an exact quote, Quote, certainly showed at this time in their patriotic ardor and love of country that there was nothing they would not do or dare, no sacrifice of life, limb, or liberty that they would not make themselves or inflict upon their opponents. So there you go. Praising Hitler for his courage, praising the SS, praising the fascist brown shirts. That is Winston Churchill. So once again, why am I going through this? Because it explains why the British Empire did not think for a second, why they didn't care for a second about the fact that they were killing hundreds of millions of people in their colonies. Because once again, fascism is the conclusion of European colonialism. European colonialism inevitably led to fascism. Fascism is directly linked to, to colonialism and capitalism. And finally today, I am going to read from an article an interview with the Indian economist Utsa Patnaik. This was published by an Indian media outlet called Mint. So I'm going to read a lot from this article here because it's just incredible how much it says about how the British Empire stole $45 trillion from India. That's the, the title of this article. British Raj, that is the British colonial regime in India, siphoned out $45 trillion from India. Utsa Patnaik. She is the award-winning Indian economist. Over roughly 200 years, the, the British East India Company 
and the British Raj siphoned out at least 9.2 trillion pounds. That is in in the in dollars in 2019 and even or 2018. So the the figure has even increased with inflation. They siphoned out 45 trillion dollars. To put that sum in context, Britain's 2018 GDP is was three trillion. So that's to say that 15 times the entire size of the British economy is how much the British Empire stole from India under British colonialism. So Western colonial powers that created capitalism, they're the ones that created the capitalist system. It was quite literally based on stolen wealth from the global south and genocide. In the colonial era, most of India's foreign exchange earnings went straight to London, severely hampering the country's ability to import machinery and technology in order to embark on modernization. So then the, this journalist asks the Indian economist Utsa Patnaik about her research. She estimates between 1765 and 1938, the British Empire drained out $45 trillion dollars taking India's export surplus earnings as the measure compounded at a 5% rate of interest. Indians were never credited with their own gold and foreign exchange earnings. Instead, local producers in India were paid in scare quotes with the rupee equivalent out of the British colonial regime's budget. But where did that, where did those rupees come from? They came from taxes. That's to say that, that it was all stolen. It was stolen wealth. The, if you listen to British colonialists today, they'll say, oh, well, we paid people. They paid people in the local currency that was stolen from them by taxation by the colonial authorities. The British drain represented around one third of the central government budget of Britain. That's to say that one third of the entire British budget was stolen wealth from India. And that's not to mention the other colonies that India had around the world. At its peak, the Indian Empire controlled more than one quarter of the landmass of the entire planet at its peak of the British Empire in the late 19th century. This obviously would have made an enormous difference if India's huge international earnings had been retained within the country, India would be far more developed. It would have much better health and social welfare indicators. There was virtually no increase in per capita income in India between 1900 and 1946, the year before the end of British colonialism. Even though India registered the second largest export surplus earnings in the world for three decades before 1929. So India was breaking records with its exports. So India was exporting huge amounts of wealth to Europe to colonize Europe. And meanwhile, per capita income, that is to say the actual income made by working people in India did not increase and poverty increased instead. Utsa Patnaik continues, since all the earnings were taken by Britain, such, such stagnation is not surprising. Ordinary Indians died like flies, owing to undernutrition and disease. It is shocking that Indian expectation of life at birth was 22 years in 1911. The average Indian lived until they were 22 years old. Because the purchasing power of ordinary Indians was being squeezed by high taxes, the per capita annual consumption of food grains decreased from 200 kilograms in 1900 to 157 kilograms on the eve of World War II, and then 137 kilograms by 1946. So the amount of food that Indians were allowed to eat over time decreased. They got, they got poorer and they got hungrier because of British colonialism. So the British, Empire, the British Imperial Project in India began with the Brit British East India Company. And between 19, excuse me, between 1765, when 
the British Empire took over Bengal, the local government, the East India Company tripled the tax revenue, tripled it. This pushed local workers in Bengal into starvation. There was a massive famine in Bengal in 1770. Out of the, the full population of 30 million, the British colonial regime estimated itself, according to its official statistics, that one third of the local population died. 10 million people in Bengal died in this famine in 1770 caused by the British Empire. So once again, it's no surprise that the British Empire inspired the Nazis. They committed the same crimes as the Nazi regime did. From 1765 until taken over by the crown officially, the British East India Company was using a quarter to third of all net revenue collections to purchase export goods from the Indian farmers. That's to say that, that the East India Company was taxing the local workers and then using that taxed wealth to buy their products. That is to say it was stealing their products. This Indian economist points out, the market is an amazing thing. It obscures real relationships. A large part of the Indian producer's own tax payment simply got converted into export goods. So the British East India Company got these goods completely free. The only Indian beneficiaries of this system of stealing wealth from India were the intermediaries known as the Dala, Dalals or Dalals. Some of, the mo some of modern India's most well-known business houses, so some of India's capitalists today, made their early profits doing Dalali for the British, so helping to be the middlemen for the colonial regime. Income taxes on businesses and professionals was non-existent until World War II. So while the British colonial regime is destroying the working class, making them starve to death with taxation, it was not taxing the local Indian capitalists who were making money off of it. So it shows that once again, the capitalists benefited from colonialism, but not the workers, not the vast majority of the population. Here, the economist Putnik stresses that, that the modern capitalist world would not exist without colonialism and the drain of wealth from the colonies. During Britain's industrial transition from 1780 until 1820, the same time period, by the way, when 100, at least 100 million Indians died, maybe 165 million Indians died. The drain from Asia and the West Indies combined was about 6% of Britain's GDP, nearly the same as its own savings rate. So 6% of the entire size of the economy. Britain was running current account deficits with continental Europe and North America, which means that it was importing more than exporting from them. So this was helping to develop Britain itself. And at the same time, it was also invest, investing massively in these regions, the, in, in its settler colonial projects, which meant running capital account deficits. So it's exporting capital as well. Potnik points out, how is it possible for Britain to export so much capital, which went into building railways, roads, and factories in the US and continental Europe? Its balance of payments deficits with these regions were being settled by appropriating the financial gold and foreign exchange earned by the colonies, especially India. Every unusual expense like war was also put on the Indian budget, and whatever India was not able to meet through its annual exchange earnings was shown to its indebtedness on which interest accumulated. So Britain was importing from other parts of Europe and, and then North America and Australia, and also exporting capital. And in order to make up for its trade deficits, it was simply using the gold and foreign currencies that it stole from India to pay for its trade deficits. So literally capitalism was founded on theft. Capitalism was founded on genocide. Capitalism was founded on colonialism. This is how Western capitalist countries got rich is through stealing the wealth of the global South. She writes, as under the British East India Company, under the British Crown too, a third of India's budgetary revenues was not spent domestically, but it was instead set aside as expenditure abroad 
That is the money that was used to fund the British Empire. So the British colonial officer overseeing India, which is the British Secretary of State, who was based in London, by the way, what happened is that the British colonial regime, the Secretary of State for India, it when it when the British Empire was exporting products from India, the foreign countries that want the foreign uh, companies that wanted to import those goods from India. So let's say if it's a company in Britain, if it's a company in the U.S., if it's a company in another part of Europe, if they want to import Indian agricultural products or textiles, how would they pay for it? They would deposit gold and sterling into the bank account in the Bank of England that was held by the Secretary of State for India. So if the U.S. or another part of Europe was paying for the import of Indian goods. They were not actually paying India. They were paying the British Empire. Those goods were stolen by the British Empire. And then what happened is that the British Empire, which was in the Bank of England, was taking all of that gold and sterling. Instead, they would issue an equivalent rupee amount in council bills to the Indian producers. So paying the Indian producers with an IOU that is denominated in rupees, the local currency. So that's to say that stealing the products from India, from the Indian producers, and then taking the gold and currency from foreign countries that want to import the Indian products, and then giving the Indian producers rupees that the British Empire would then tax away. So literally, the British Empire was stealing that wealth, stealing those products. So that mean, that's to say that tens of millions of Indian farmers were basically slaves for the British Empire. They were giving their products for free to the British Empire. And then when there wasn't a famine, when they weren't starving to death, they were living in extreme poverty. Britain had complete command over all of the international purchasing power, purchasing power that Indian producers had earned. Now, there's an interesting question in here toward the end of this interview, which I really want to read here. The journalist asked this Indian economist, Utsa Patnaik, the world has changed considerably since the 19th century, and China's recent foray into Africa is sometimes referred to as the new form of imperialism. And she pushed back against this ridiculous idea that China is a new colonial power. Utsa Patnaik says, quote, it would be quite incorrect to call either China or for that matter, Indian entrepreneurs in Africa as modern imperialists. They are not imperialists, she said. She continues, this is a ploy that the North, the global North uses to deflect attention from the crimes that they committed against our people after getting forcible political control. So the European Western colonialists, they are accusing China of what they did. Britain and other countries taxed the colonized took their foreign earnings, and drove them into hunger. Chinese and Indian entrepreneurs in Africa are merely trying to do business in agreement with independent governments. We can never hope to replicate the development path that global North countries followed. They dealt with rural displacement and rising unemployment through massive permanent outmigration, mainly to the Americas. That option is not open to labor surplus India or China. So once again, what China is doing in Africa is in no way similar, similar to what the European colonialists did to the global south. Now, this is one of the last questions here. The journalists ask about trade barriers once again going up. Is there a lesson that we can learn from the colonial experience? And Utsa Patnaik says, the lesson we have to learn is to disengage. I am not unhappy at the idea of protectionism in the West. Because frankly, we have to turn our eyes inward. We have an enormous domestic market and its purchasing capacity needs to be raised. We must trade more with other developing countries and trade on terms which are not exploitative. Essentially, fair trade, not free trade, fair trade. The developing world must start thinking in terms of cooperative solutions. Some barriers to trade with the northern countries are also essential because the dogma of so-called free trade was promoted by them, the colonial powers, to serve at their interests at our expense. Transnational, transnational companies, these Western corporations, 
are trying to change our cropping patterns toward export crops as they did during the colonial period. They want free access to our agriculture because they cannot ever produce the crops we can, particularly in winter. So if you take a, a, an economics, a neoclassical economics class, they talk about David Ricardo and comparative advantage. And it says that, you know, Portugal produces wine and Britain produces textiles. And even though maybe, it, it, maybe technically uh, Portugal could produce more textiles, it's actually in Portugal's comparative advantage to produce wine. And it's in Britain's comparative advantage to produce textiles, even though Britain could also produce wine. I mean, no, that, that classic neoclassical economics is just justification for colonialism. The idea that, that countries should only continue to produce based on their comparative advantage is what traps countries like India in being export colonies, basically. They don't develop local technology and local industry. Instead, they just be, they're just a resource extraction hub. So Utsapotnik points out, tropical countries should be banding together in order to use the year-round pr productivity of their lands as a bargaining chip to obtain better terms of trade for their farmers. Today's, the, the countries that are the advanced capitalist, formerly colonial countries, to their day, to, to this day, they are highly dependent on the ex-colonial world for their standard of living. Nearly 70% of the items sold in the modern supermarket in the West is imported from the tropics, from the global South. The terms of trade are still not fair, yet many still adhere to the belief that the advanced capitalist countries became advanced because they are sup supposedly innovative or entrepreneurial. She says, this is fake history. We need to talk about real history. She talks about how the Cambridge economic history of India, for example, doesn't mention the stringent protectionist policy against Asian textiles that Britain maintained during the British Empire. Or it doesn't mention the Brit that, that Britain stole all of India's export surplus earnings for 180 years. And then, and then they talk about how what the, the British Empire did is not even exactly what the same as the local uh, dynasties did. This is not to praise the you know, feudal regimes that governed for hundreds of years, but the Mughal Empire, which, which governed India, they also did what the Rajasthan princes, that's the uh, previous you know, feudal regimes, they taxed the people, but in moderation, and they spent all taxes within the country. It's not what the European colonialists did. They were fundamentally different. And finally, what are the conclusions for today? This is what the Indian economist Utsapotnik says. Not only Britain, but, the whole of, but all of today's advanced capitalist world flourished on the drain from India and other colonies. Britain was too small to absorb the entire drain from colonial India, so it became the world's largest capital exporter which aided the industrial development of continental Europe, the U.S., and even Russia. That's Tsarist Zar Russia at the time. The infrastructure boom in these countries would not have been possible otherwise. So once again, the capitalist countries, they developed themselves based on stealing wealth from the global south. Colonial drain helped to create the modern capitalist world. From North America to Australia, all regions where European populations settled. The advanced capitalist world should set aside a portion of its GDP for unqualified annual transfers, that's reparations, to developing countries, especially to the poorest among them. Britain in particular owes reparations for the 3 million civilians who died in the Bengal famine because it was an engineered famine. So that is the interview that this Indian economist Utsa Patnaik did with the Indian outlet Mint, it's titled British Raj siphoned out 45 trillion from India. So once again, when we're talking about fascism, we have to understand it is directly linked to colonialism. That is where fascism came from in Europe. And it's not a coincidence that the British Empire was re responsible for, at least in a conservative estimate, 100 million people dying in India just in 40 years.